Okay, so we already covered, yeah, please. Generally, no, it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. And when we release the lab document, we will have also the percentage of the course uh, of the lab in, in front of it. And some of the lab uh, questions will also be bonus questions in the case that you don't have it. They're not part of the total grade, but if you answer them, you would basically have uh, a bonus percentage into the overall grade. OK, so what is a computer? Part of it is we already discussed into what we're going to cover in the course because this is our interest in, in 4DM4. Well, there is a processor in a computer, there is input output devices, there are memories, and there is usually a network. This network can be an interconnect within the chip or even uh, a network outside of the chip, which is, for example, connectivity to a Wi-Fi or Ethernet or, or even a local network. Right? So there is a network in, in the in the macro definition or in the micro definition. Um, our primary focus would be mainly in, again, the processor. I wouldn't say data path and control only, but also the topics we, we kind of uh, mentioned we're going to cover, including caches, pipelining, multi cores, etc. Well, a very simplistic view of a processor or a, or a computer in general is you have a factory that simply takes some inputs and then store them in the memory to operate on them and then execute some instructions that really does some processing and then at the end of the day gives you the output right so for example you access chrome then you go to a certain website this is your input that you want to go to that website the processing happens in the background magically and then all of a sudden the page appears on the screen the screen is simply the output device and the, the actual data that you see here is well what constitutes the pixels in your screen so, well, there are multiple things. How do we input the data to the computer? Well, multiple input devices, um, multiple things, a keyboard, a, a mouse, and a touch screen, all, um, and there are other means as well. But then how can we process this input, right? Usually there are programs that we write that later on will become applications. And then when we use these applications, we execute certain instructions into the input field, right? So if you look into, a very high level C program. Here, for example, I'm doing a, a square function that we add in, into SH. Then, if I want to swap to, for example, I provided two inputs, I want to swap them. So, my input is that the two things that I want to swap, which is here, this uh, uh, B, yeah, the well, two elements of basic array, V, and then I'm taking, I'm swapping P, P and K plus one, right? So the input here is the actual array and the pointer of what elements I want to swap. So in that case, once I get that input, I want that program to execute this swap and then gives me the output right after the swap. Someone else, it can be me as well, program that program for me, right? At the end of the day, as a user, I'm having the binary, but someone really developed the, the software of that binary. So, well, as a programmer, Assuming, for example, again, this was an exercise in 2SH, you wrote that piece of program. Then we still didn't say how does this program materialize into the actual execution of the hardware. Uh, based on the discussion we mentioned yesterday, there is a compiler that simply takes this high level C code, translates it into some sort of an assembly, right? You can look here into that's the, this is a MEPS instruction set because it's very easy for you, it doesn't really matter. We did it similar to other ICs as well. But these are the assembly instructions that does read the swap. Can you identify some of the instructions you might know from here? Load word, thank you. And basically, load word, you're getting something from the memory, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about that program, well, it seems that this is an array, so I'm getting it from the memory. So I want to get the two elements from the memory for the array to swap, right? This is why I have two loads, right? And if you think about the two loads, they are offset basically by four, right? Because this seems like an end array, right? And well, end elements are four bytes. So I am really loading these two elements one after the other, and then doing two stores because after I load, I do the swap and then store them back, right? And then there is something that basically does the addition because here I'm using the pointer and pointer plus one, right? So simply that's the assembly of that tool. But then also hardware does not 
understand assembly as we said yesterday, understand machine. So after the compiler, there is an assembler that simply takes that assembly code and translate it into the zeros and ones, right? Zeros and ones are simply what the computers understand and what the control back would understand. One important note here is going from a high level C program into assembly code is in fact not a one to one map. What does it mean? If you take the same piece of code and you run it through, yesterday you mentioned GCC and LLVM as two compilers, right? If you run this code through GCC or even the same version, two different versions of the same compiler, GCC, you might end up with a different assembly, right? Why that's the case? Because this problem is not a definitive answer problem, right? It's, it's something that based on how does the compiler optimize the code, right? You might end up with optimized code like this, or you might end up with something that is not optimized and has like 100 assembly instructions, right? And even the word optimize, what are we optimizing for? If we're optimizing for the number of instructions is one thing, but if we're also optimizing for the running time, that's another thing, right? So there are multiple versions of the assembly for the same program. How to optimize the assembly generation? That's a topic of a compiler scope. Again, as we said yesterday. But from here to here, that's the part that's important to us. From an assembly to the machine code, this is a one to one map. Who guarantees this? Who guarantees that this is a one to one map? The IEC, thank you. So that's the contract that we defined yesterday, right? The IEC is the one that is telling me this is an add instruction, it has a certain opcode. Basically, 0001, 00100, for example, might mean an ad, mean an ad, then you basically have something like this. Then this is an operand that has a certain address, the same thing in the same thing, right? So the decoding, the, this, this decoding that happens from one side by the assembler and from the hardware by the decode unit must be one to one. Otherwise, the same program can give you two different answers, right? So it has to be one to one according to the ISA contract. Well, th this is kind of a philosophical discussion, but why do we have high level languages? Why we don't write assembly? Because, well, it's more human nature. And it's very hard to write, not very efficient, but also very important for maintainability. Uh, uh, it's also very important for modularity, uh, well, code sharing, productivity, all the things that we have discussed in object oriented programming concepts, right? You will never be able to execute these things in. Well, assembly, put aside writing zeros and ones, right? Okay, so now we have those zeros and we want to execute them into the hardware. So how does the hardware do this? How does the machine do this? Well, we have what we call functional units, right? The functional units are simply circuitry, right? It's a module, it's an add, subtract, uh, shift that takes a certain enabled signals and tells, OK, I want to shift, or maybe I want to add this register, another register, and put the results in the third register, right? <laughs> so it takes operands as an input. It outputs an operand, but usually operates on, on registers, as we will see later on, and then does a, a symbol operation. Well, not necessarily symbol. It's a, it's a risk to symbol, but something like addition, subtraction, multiplication, right? shifting. Um, but if I have multiple of these function units within my chip, they must be talking to each other, right? Because as you can think here, if I go back to the program, the output of one function unit will be used as an input to another one, right? This is how I execute a meaningful program. So in that case, you need an interconnect between them, which usually what we call a bus, or in, in some modern uh, systems on chip, there is a network on a chip. And uh, well, the way I describe this machine, Simply people write uh, an RTL code, uh, it's a register transfer level, which is simply an HDL description, hardware hardware description language that is used to describe the circuitry that I implement in my machine. So if I look into that view, so I have the memory, again we have the end outputs, then we have the control and the data path, right? Here we have the network. For example, this is your network connectivity card, your different card that takes you to the outside world. Now, as, I as we were saying, the DICE is the one that guarantees the one-to-one -one mapping, or basically makes sure that the contract is uh, satisfied from all entities. We look into the ad here for a MIPS. 
MEPS is the one, the IC is the one that is telling me the add instruction has an off code. What is an off code? Basically, we use the word off code to describe the bits that describe the instruction itself. Because if you look into any instruction of those, these are an instruction name and there are operands you operate on, right? The instruction name should be independent of the operands. If it's an add, then it's an add, right? In that case, it's why in MEPS, for example, add means six zeros, right? And then what well, six zeros and some other extensions again, right? Because you are adding basically registers to each other. You can also add an immediate value to a register. There are multiple variations. Uh, in in Intel, you can add a memory address to another register, but, but that's a different story. And then what about the operands? Those operands are registers, right? Which means they are stored somewhere in a place that we call a register file. In most machines, a register file is basically an addressable memory. You can think of it like a small SRAM. Uh, it might be 32 registers, 64 registers. So you need an address to go ahead to that register file and say, bring me this specific register. This address is the one that is basically included in the instruction itself. So here we are saying register 4 is address using 0010. As you can tell me, because this is 0010 is a 4, in fact, right? So we are just using a simple view of the registers. Starting from register zero as all zeros, then all the way down to register 30, 31, because so you have 32 registers. So this is basically one operand. The second operand, as you can tell, is register two. Uh, and the register two is that one, right? These are the two input operands. And then you add them and you and then you put the result in register two back, right? So in, in MEPS, if you are adding the result to one of the input registers, well, they basically include it in a particular way, so you don't have to write the register destination again, right? This is how things really work. And then, in that case, well, here, I guess it's written in a way that you also have to write it. So this is the version that is not very optimized uh, with this ISA. But simply, here the destination is 00010, so it's a little bit shifted, but that's my destination. But when I get these three of bits for the hardware, how do I know that I need to execute that app? Simply, I'm going to take these 32 bits. I know that the first six bits will be for, for the instruction name, meaning opcode. I have to take it, do some decoders, hopefully borrow your knowledge from digital design that you can build the decoder. And then I say, if this is all zeros, that means it's an add instruction. What does it mean? It means that as a decode unit, I need to uh, basically uh, set my select values for the ALU to do an add operation, right? And then once I know that I need to do an add, I need also to fetch the two registers as an input. So I take that address and that address, go to the register file, bring the values from these two registers, and then add them. Once you get the output, you store it back to the register file in the destination address, right? This is simply how, in a very simplistic view, uh, a simple processor would really take the instruction bits themselves, the ones you have wrote in C, but then translated into assembly and then machine code, and they execute the actual functionality you are looking for, right? Good. Is there any question here? Okay. Another example for the store because it has a memory operation. But then, first of all, I got my C code, I got the binary file. Where does one question we didn't ask here is when I was explaining to you that a machine is really executing this instruction. We never said where does the decode unit even get this 32 bits, right? Where does it get it from? And you don't go to the decode unit just from nowhere, right? You have to go ahead and bring them from somewhere. Where usually the hardware gets the, the instructions. From the area, from the memory in general, that's correct, right? So usually your program is stored in the memory, right? Who stores your program in the memory? Yeah, well, a driver if you load it from outside, right? But usually in your mobile phone, you don't really load something from outside, right? You double click like an application so you launch it, right? So what happens? This is something we have discussed in 2SH, for example. There is what we call a loader, right? Right? Remember that there is a loader that simply once you open the application. This binary file is nothing other than really all user wants in addition to the data. 
Once you double click them, you take a snapshot, you put it in the memory, and then you start executing it one by one. Good. So let's stop here and we continue on Friday. This is all time. Thank you. Yeah, I sent you an email for Todd and.